Polymers and biopolymers are going to be what we're discussing in this lesson. And uh, a polymer is just a repeating chain of uh, very similar molecules, or in many cases, identical molecules, it turns out. And uh, a big branch of chemistry, a lot of plastics and things of a sort, are examples of polymers. So uh, think of any plastic or think of styrofoam, another example of a polymer. Uh, and it turns out they're going to come in two major classes, addition polymers and condensation polymers. And we'll describe the difference between those two. Uh, and then we'll talk about three biopolymers that are present in your body. We'll talk about proteins, which are a polymer of amino acids. We'll talk about carbohydrates, uh, which may exist as polymers uh, of individual monomer, we say uh, monosaccharide units. Uh, and then we'll talk about nucleic acids briefly as well, which are also polymers. There's things like DNA and RNA, uh, again, inside your body and every living creature. Now, this lesson's part of my high school chemistry playlist. Now, it turns out it's the last lesson uh, as it now stands in my high school chemistry playlist. But if you want to be notified when I begin releasing videos in my next playlist, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so as we stated in the intro here, so a polymer uh, is when you connect a, uh, a number of identical or very similar looking reactants into a big long chain. So it turns out we call the individual subunits monomers. And then when you start hooking them together, you make a polymer. And that polymer, you know, could be 10 subunits long. It could be a million subunits long. It all depends on, uh, you know, what kind of compound we're talking about and stuff like this. So uh, first kind of polymer we're going to take a look at is called an addition polymer. So, and in this case, we're going to use all identical subunits. So this is called vinyl chloride. I've got three vinyl chloride molecules together. It turns out commonly in, uh, this is actually going to end up as a polymer being polyvinyl chloride, by the way. Uh, and so it turns out for a lot of different plastics, though, you're going to end up with alternating uh, monomers that are different from each other. And it goes like one, then the other, one, then the other, one, then the other. When you've got multiple different monomers involved in making a polymer, we call it a copolymer. So, but in this case, because every single monomer is exactly the same, it is not called a copolymer. It is just simply going to be referred to as a polymer. Now it turns out your addition polymers are typically going to involve alkenes. It could have in principle involved an alkyne, but usually they involve alkenes. And the way this works is that you end up breaking the pi bond, the second bond of the double bond here, and using those electrons to make a new bond to the next alkene. And then to make room for that, he breaks his bond and uses it to make a bond to the next alkene. And then he does the same thing to the next one. So, and typically you've got to, you know, add some sort of initiating agent. We call it initiator. And sometimes they are radicals, but they don't have to be in principle. But you've got to add some sort of initiator into a solution of, say, vinyl chloride in this case to get this to happen. And poof, out comes plastic, in this case, polyvinyl chloride. And so if we take a look at what this looks like, we're going to end now with six carbons. So which would be a rather short polymer in this case. These usually are millions and zillions and billions uh, long, typically. Uh, and in this case, we've got hydrogens here, here, and here, and a chlorine here. Hydrogens here, here, and here, and a chlorine here. Hydrogens here, here, and here, and a chlorine here. And then this could potentially just keep going in both directions very long ways. Now, if you look at the smallest repeating unit here, you could kind of pick it out here, here, or here. I'm just going to pick it out right here and we'll put an N. And so sometimes to show you what the structure of polymer looks like, because it's just really, really long, we pick out the simplest repeating unit and put it in brackets and just put an N there for a lot N meaning just a lot of them. Cool. So this is a classic example of an addition polymer. And again, what's going to really change from addition polymer to addition polymer is one of two things. One, do you have a single monomer or do you have a copolymer with multiple monomers? And then what are the four things attached to the alkene essentially is usually the difference. And sometimes uh, you can put more halogens in here. You could attach a benzene ring. There's a whole variety of different polymers. And based on what you attach in these four positions can actually make your polymer, you know, uh, stronger and weaker and more elastic or less elastic. And, and you can change the properties by just changing what groups 
are attached in these positions. Once again, this is polyvinyl chloride, which is you know commonly how we name many polymers. Is if it's based off a single monomer, we might just call it poly and then name the monomer. And notice vinyl chloride here is actually a common name, a historical name, not the IUPAC name we would have used here. We would have called this like one chloroethene or something like that, but nobody calls it that. This has been around forever, and so people just call this vinyl chloride. And once again, that would be polyvinyl chloride. All right, so the second type of polymer we're gonna study are called condensation polymers. And in a condensation polymer, you end up forming some small molecule, which is most commonly water. So it forms water molecules along the way. And if you know condensation, we often refer to as when, you know, water vapor turns into liquid water, it forms liquid water. So appropriate name here, since most condensation reactions you're likely to see are gonna form a small molecule with water being the most common. Now, it doesn't actually have to be water. You might see some that have actually formed like HCl and stuff, but you guys are probably only likely to see ones that form water molecules. Now, in this case, I'm gonna do a copolymer here. I've got two different monomers I'm gonna use here. And uh, in this case, I've got this guy acting as an alcohol. So this one acting as a carboxylic acid, that's its functional group right here. And it turns out an alcohol and a carboxylic acid can react in a condensation reaction to form an ester with water being lost along the way. And so this OH here and this H right here are actually gonna be lost as water. So if we take a look at what's going on here, So we take that water out and this oxygen will now be bonded to this carbon right here. So the same thing's gonna happen on the other side here. Once again, we're gonna lose this right here as water, H2O. And then this carbon is now gonna be bonded to the oxygen over here instead. And then you could just keep going and these molecules would alternate back and forth all down the chain of zillions long. So I'm gonna cut that off right there. And once again, if you want to find your you know, shortest repeating unit here, now you'd have to incorporate both monomers, so to speak. And so maybe we do something like here. So oxygen, carbon, carbon, oxygen, and then the ring. So in this case, on the other side, we don't want to include the oxygen right here. So we'll cut it right here and go N. Now that's not the only way we could have done it. We could have cut it like right from here to here and it included the oxygen on the right hand side, but not the left. So, but that would be our shortest repeating unit that encompasses both monomers that'll just keep repeating on and on down the chain. And again, this is an example of a condensation polymer. And if you notice right here, we formed an ester where you've got a carbon oxygen double bond. So bonded to another oxygen with a carbon chain on both sides. So cool. And that's a common organic chemistry reaction with, between a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. In fact, we call it a Fischer esterification, which you definitely don't have to know, but it gets a name and we can use it to our advantage in this polymerization reaction. Ah, and one thing I forgot to do, I forgot to draw in the little water molecules that we actually formed. One on this side and then obviously one on this side. I want to make a note of that. All right, the first biopolymer we're gonna look at are proteins. And so the name of the polymer is proteins. Uh, the name of the monomer we call it as an amino acid. And so it turns out we've got an example of an amino acid. And you can see why they call it amino acid. We have an amine over at this end. And we have a carboxylic acid over at this end. And it turns out we can connect them in big long chains in polymerization reactions. And it turns out it's a condensation polymerization reaction. Uh, and it turns out uh, the amino acids uh, aren't all the same. There's actually 20 or so uh, that are incorporated into your body. And the difference between them, it turns out they have a uh, real similar structure with one major difference. And it's just what's attached at this carbon right here. So in the case of glycine, it's just a little hydrogen atom. In the case of like alanine, it's a methyl group. And they get more complicated from there. So, but that's the only major difference between the vast majority of those 20 amino acids. And so you can just hook them up in big long chains. And what's gonna differ is what's coming off attached to them in this sort. So 
So these proteins, it turns out, uh, serve a couple of different major roles in your body. So they might just serve as, you know, a point of structure in your body. So they might give shells their particular shape and stuff like this. And there are a variety of proteins that function in that regard. Uh, but a greater number of proteins are actually going to function in catalysis. They're going to catalyze a lot of the chemical reactions that need to happen in your body. And so when you get a protein that actually is a catalyst, we call it an enzyme. So almost all the enzymes you're ever likely to encounter, those are proteins. And I say almost all, there are a couple of funky exceptions where it might be an RNA molecule, but in general, when we say enzyme, we mean proteins. And so all enzymes, almost all enzymes are proteins, but not all proteins are enzymes because you have some that are purely structural in that regard. Now it turns out again, uh, our monomers are going to be called these amino acids and we can hook them up in chains. So let's get an idea of what that might look like here. Let me put a couple of them up on the board here. All right, so now I've put up three very specific amino acids here. We've got glycine, which just has a hydrogen, alanine, which just has a methyl group, and then serine with the CH2OH group. And it turns out the different groups that are attached here and even the order in which they're attached is gonna cause these proteins in the end to fold into a very characteristic shape. And it's that shape that's gonna allow it to function appropriately. And if you put one of the wrong amino acids in the wrong spot, it's not gonna be in the right shape. And if it doesn't take the right shape, it's probably not gonna serve the function it's supposed to. And that's the problem with mutations. When you get a, a mutation in your DNA, it's the DNA that actually gives the order for these amino acids. And so if you get a mutation, it might all of a sudden now lead to the wrong amino acid being incorporated into a protein. And if that protein has a specific job to do and now it's not doing it, uh, depending on how serious that is to you know the, the function or life of the organism, uh, it could be a big deal, it could be a minor deal, uh, but most of the time they end up being pretty big deals. Most of the stuff you have in your body are there for a reason. You need them. All right, so let's see how this looks here. So in this case, we're gonna do another condensation reaction. So and in this case, we're gonna lose the OH and we're gonna lose one of the H's right there as well to form, once again, water. And we'll do that here and once again, we'll do it right here. One of these H's on the nitrogen and once again, we're gonna form water. And now all of a sudden, this carbonyl carbon will be attached to the nitrogen here and once again here. And let's see what that polymer looks like. If you've got the study guide handy, it's already drawn there for you. All right, so here is the polymeric structure here, and I've formed what we call a peptide bond in those two cases. And it's just an amide linkage. It turns out this is now an amide functional group you might recognize. And, uh, but the amide bond in a protein we call a peptide bond, and they're fairly stable. And so in this case, if this was all there was, just these three amino acids, we might call this a tripeptide or something like that. Uh, but once you incorporate uh, and create the entire protein, uh, we call it a protein at that point. And they might incorporate, you know, hundreds or even thousands of amino acids long. So some of these proteins can get quite large. So, but this is your first example of a biopolymer. Let's take a look at another. All right, so now we'll talk about carbohydrates. And this could be a bad word, you know, depending on who you are. And we've got the, the keto diet, no carbs and things of a sort. So, Carbohydrates. So oftentimes, you know, you think of those mostly in a dietary sense and you think of like sugars and starches and things of that sort. And, and that's sure, certainly a part of it, but there's quite a bit more to it in a bio, uh, a biological context here and stuff. So first I want to talk about what a, a carbohydrate is. And we want to talk about sugars for a second. So uh, because sugars are typically the monomers of most carbohydrates. And so in this case, we might call a sugar a monosaccharide when it's a single sugar unit. It turns out that a lot of the sugars have six carbons here. So, and a lot of them also form rings like this. In fact, most of them do. And so they have two different forms. So notice this is D-glucose, but this is also D-glucose. Now, when it turns into a ring like this, it turns out it just wraps around on itself and forms a ring. So we call it alpha D-glucose or beta D-glucose, and the name's not important here. But I do want you to recognize in either structure. Notice all the OHs on this thing. So regardless of how you look at it, these things are very water soluble as a result of all the hydrogen bonding they're capable of. So just like sugar dissolves in water. So, and it turns out the sugars uh, in your body can act, uh, they can exist, I should say, as monosaccharides, as monomers. They can form dimers. It turns out when you connect a glucose to a fructose, you get sucrose, which is what your table sugar, so cane sugar, is made of. 
So, but we can also form polymers out of these as well. And so plants are going to take a bunch of glucose molecules and they're going to connect them together in big, long chains. And that's how they store the glucose. This is your body's main fuel for energy. And so being able to store it as a plant would be a good idea. And plants store it as starch. And you've got enzymes, amylase, that can break down that starch, which is why you can eat starch. And it's a fuel source. It's a glucose source for you in your diet. On the other hand, uh, cellulose, which is in like plant cell walls and in, uh, you know, the fiber component of eating vegetables and stuff like that. So cellulose is also a glucose polymer, but instead of being alpha glucose, it's often beta glucose, which is one little bond is different. And it turns out you just don't have the enzymes to break those kind of bonds though. And as a result, you actually can't digest cellulose. And that's why it just passes right through your digestive system, acting as fiber. And it's good for you, I guess, to just pass right through your digestive system. So, but you can't get any calories out of it in that case. So, uh, and then you yourself, you need a, uh, to store glucose as well for a rainy day. And uh, usually it's your liver and your muscles that are doing it. And they also form another glucose polymer called glycogen. Now you, plants will store it as starch, but you're going to store it as glycogen, which is some little bit different bonding patterns and some, some instead of just a straight chain, and I'll put a, a picture of starch up on the board screen at some point here, um, but glycogen, a little bit different kind of polymer, but it's still just a glucose polymer stored in a little bit different fashion. And you can just snip off the ends and get as much, you know, little tiny glucose monomers as you need to uh, put in your bloodstream and keep your brain functioning, keep your heart functioning and keep, you know, stay alive and stuff like this as need be. And it's your liver's job to do that. And so, but your muscles need their own personal private storage as well. And so they store their own glycogen as well so that when they need glucose and fight or flight, if there's a hungry lion chasing you or something like that, that they've got ready access to glucose stores as well. Um, but that's a carbohydrate. And once again, really, you just want to be able to recognize from the structure, whether it be the straight chain form here, but more likely the cyclic form here, whether it's monomers or whether it's tied up in a polymer, you're just really going to want to recognize the structure of a carbohydrate. Um, and notice very different than what we saw with proteins and amino acids as the monomers. But once again, another possible biopolymer that's used pretty liberally uh, in most living systems. All right, the last class of biopolymer we're going to take a look at are nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. And it turns out they have a very characteristic structure associated with them. And it turns out there's multiple parts to them. So it turns out they themselves have a sugar component. They have a five-membered ring sugar component, not like glucose, which is mostly uh, going to form as a six-membered ring. But they do have a five-membered ring. And one thing to note on my structure here, I have omitted drawing in a lot of the hydrons for clarity's sake. So a lot of the hydrons here are not drawn in. So, but it turns out they've got a sugar here and the sugar involved here is called ribose. So in the case of RNA, and it turns out RNA would also have another OH right here, just like most of the carbons in a sugar have an OH, whereas deoxyribose, so which is what I've drawn here, is missing the OH coming off that carbon. And that's the only difference between the monomer in DNA and the monomer in RNA. Or I shouldn't say it's the only difference, it's the main difference. All right. So from here, we've also going to have a phosphate group. So, and it's the phosphate group that actually is going to be used in joining two of these nucleic acids together. So we could take another one of these and put it down here. And right here would be attaching this oxygen right here of the next, uh, the next uh, nucleic acid in the sequence. And then finally over here, we're going to have some sort of nitrogenous, what we call base. So we learned that amines are bases, and then typically the group over here is gonna be some sort of base, and it turns out there's four common ones in DNA. So, and we represent the letters, uh, the first letter of each of those names of those bases as A, C, G, and T. So the ribose or deoxyribose part and the phosphate part, that's gonna be the same, but the four different bases is how we get some variability, and that's how we store genetic information, is just which of these four is in a certain location, and what's the order, and things of that sort. So, but DNA and RNA are used to both store or the genetic information in a cell, typically in the nucleus uh, for eukaryotes. Uh, and then the RNA we can use to make a copy of that DNA, and then we can deliver it out to get it translated into using to make proteins. So you can kind of think of the DNA as containing the recipes for all the proteins in your body. You copy it into RNA, and then we have these organelles called ribosomes that read only RNA. They don't read DNA. They can only read the RNA copy you've made and then translate that into uh, a certain protein. And so that's how all the proteins are made. All the instructions for making all your proteins all contained in the DNA. So, and I'll put up on the screen here, 
uh, an example. So DNA, it turns out, uh, you know, is going to exist as a DNA double helix. So it turns out you're going to have one strand going one direction, one strand going the other direction, and those two polymeric strands are going to interact with each other through hydrogen bonding. Cool. And I've just put a couple of different base pairs, the, the, the two different strands and their interactions uh, we call base pairs, and they happen in characteristic ways and stuff like this. So, uh, but that's all I really want to get into uh, as far as nucleic acids. And once again, the big thing is that you should, if I give you a structure, so you should recognize the structure that it's a nucleic acid. It's not a protein. It's not a carbohydrate. It's a nucleic acid. Uh, that's the biggest takeaway here you want to get. Now, if you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? One of the best things you can do to promote the channel and best thing you can do to make sure that other students get to see this lesson as well. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you are looking for practice problems on this organics chemistry section of my high school chemistry course, uh, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com. A free trial is available.